Hey, 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 guys. Welcome to Building This Community. This is your city business and policy development podcast. We're your hosts, Luke Patrick and Andrew Klump. Welcome to this week's episode of Building This Community. Our guests today are Terry and Cheryl Boyd, who are the co-founders and co-CEOs of Dispatches Europe, a tech news and communications website. And they are also the co-founders of what is now formerly known as Insider Louisville. With that said, Terry and Cheryl, how are you? We're super. It's uh, a beautiful day in the Netherlands, 50 and cloudy, which is pretty much the situation all year long. That's that's great to hear. So <laughs> can you tell us a just a little bit more about your background? I know I just talked a little bit about Dispatches Europe and Inside the World, but can you, can you point? We, we're sort of a tech website, but we're uh, basically Dispatches Media is a communications company and we do a lot of different things. The website obviously is the the public facing part of our business, but there, there's a lot more to it. Dispatches Europe is, as I said, a communications company and we have clients and we provide a lot of different service for those clients. Cheryl really is the person who deals with that end of the business. And we also have uh, some ancillary businesses. One is Tech Sister Cities. We've done several events. We brought Jonathan Blue uh, from Blue Equity here to I and Dublin to talk to our startup uh, ecosystem. And that was part, that was a Tech Sister City program. We've done, I guess, the airport. That was. Yep. I know of an airport. Um, we did an event for them. We flew in people from Rome and Lisbon. And uh, as the local people try to recruit highly skilled internationals. Speaking of which, highly skilled internationals are actually our focus group for the, the core of our business. Oh, and then there's tier one tech talent, which is another piece, but we won't go into that. So, so then are, is it essentially a new, a tech news outlet plus a job outlet as well? Like a, for, for expats and people looking to move to Europe? Yeah. So, so as Terry said, it's dispatches of media is a, is at the core communications company. We have the website, Dispatches Europe, which is news information, including startup and tech news. And our audience is English speaking expats in Europe, although we have readers worldwide in every country. Yeah, about 134 countries uh, per, per month. Yeah, come to our come to our website. And so that's, as he said, the public facing communication platform. But then also we have these other initiatives, including a Marcom department where uh, we write marketing communications for mostly venture builders and accelerators in the deep tech and high tech space, as well as startups and scale ups, also high tech and deep tech startup and scale ups. So that's uh, another part. And then the, the two sort of side initiatives are tech sister cities, which uh, connects tech cities in Europe, starting in the Netherlands with uh, cities in the, the States. And then tier one tech talent is an investment sort of networking placement group where we put together, uh, we bring together investors in the Midwest with startup and scale ups in the Netherlands. Interesting. So, uh, <laughs> you, you, you brought up one term that I, I think might be great to clarify for our audience. Can you explain what deep tech is for a second? Deep tech would be sort of the cutting edge technology in the semiconductor business. The dominant company here is ASML, and they they dominate the photolithography business. So they build these giant room size machines that enable companies to build chips. And they, their machines burn, they use light and now ultraviolet rays to burn circuitry, tiny, tiny little microcircuitry into uh, semiconductor chips. So in a, basically nothing happens in the digital world without ASML, even though you've never heard of them. <laughs> ASML the way the Dutch do, but it's actually ASML. That's what we've taken on the Dutch pronunciation. Pronunciation of that. 
<laughs> fair, fair enough. Well, I, I appreciate the clarification. So what is, uh, what, what did your experience kind of with insider Louisville, uh, help you in starting a new, uh, media outlet and, and service in the Netherlands? Uh, not much because <laughs> what we did in, with in, Insider Louisville was com- completely different than what we do now. That was completely focused on business. And what we're doing now is so much more. What really helped us build dispatches is the fact that we lived in Turkey for four years, then we lived in Germany four years. So we understood what international life was like. And we understood that there's this huge number of people, probably about 17 million people around the world who are highly skilled expats, highly skilled internationals. And they they do everything from working at the top levels of the biggest global corporations to, you know, kind of what we do, which is just faffing about. I wouldn't say we're faffing about, but what we do is provide information for all those expats Europe wide, because, you know, to move to another country, there's some things you need to know and you need to know huge uh, challenges, huge challenges, finding a job, finding housing, finding schools. If you have children, uh, finding a bank, finding a bank, um, which is one of the toughest. And so, yeah, anybody who thinks, if you think you guys think you're just going to move to Europe because it sounds like a fun thing to do. It's really very, very difficult. Lots of hoops, lots of bureaucracy. And we try to help people with that. We don't try. We do. We yes. do help people with that. Uh, those are definitely admirable goals. And I think it kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to bring up, which we've kind of seen this pandemic reshape globally, the workforce. And and I think notably the the thing that has increased is our capacity to work for home. If, if, you know, it's available in the industry, do you think those types of policies are going to stay intact uh, post pandemic? And what does that mean for people that are thinking about, or maybe in the process of relocating, uh, especially from your all's perspective in Europe? We're completely divided on this. I'll let Cheryl go first. because <laughs> I, I think she doesn't think much will change after the pandemic. Well, what we've seen um, in the Netherlands, you know, we had a a partial shutdown in March. And in fact, we were in the middle of organizing or helping a client organize a big uh, tech hackathon uh, to attract people to to begin uh, to form companies and start their venture building program. And uh, the shutdown happened. Our event was planned for the following week and we had to completely take it online, having never used Microsoft Teams before, uh, they couldn't not hold the event because it meant, you know, they wouldn't be able to move forward with their program that they already had um, ready to go for these startups. So we helped them in seven days, basically, pull it all, uh, put it all online. And I think we had uh, about a hundred people at that hackathon, a crazy, crazy success. So it, it, di- it didn't mean that, uh, you had to stop doing business. And that's what we've seen here is that everybody just didn't miss a beat. They kept on going with their business, working online because, you know, the government said you had to, uh, they made sure that everyone who could work from home did work from home. And what I think, um, it hasn't been necessarily all bad. I mean, there's been some silver linings in that, uh, in particular for, for this, uh, venture builder, they've been able to now recruit uh, co-founders and team members from 20 different countries. Uh, whereas before, if it had been a live event, they wouldn't have gotten that kind of um, attendance response, yeah, yeah. response. Yeah. So I don't think it's been all bad. And I do think that particularly in the Netherlands, uh, there's going to be more and more of this. In fact, just yesterday, we went into a total lockdown. So retail stores are not open. Schools are closed. We're all, everybody in the Netherlands is working from home. And Terry, did you say you had kind of a difference of opinion about how this is going to play out long-term? Everybody is working from home and everybody hates it. And there's (laughs) not, there's there's no, 
it's impossible to read each other. You can't see all the global, I mean, the global, the facial cues. You, we, I think we all feel a little bit confined. And I never thought that I would love going to the office and seeing everybody, but I would love to go to the office and see everybody. <laughs> We work with a whole lot of young kids and I do miss them all. I do. I really do. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think that the younger generation that you work with feel the same way? Yeah, I don't. They're, it's funny because they're all digital natives, right? But I don't know. Kids under 30, I think they're just so programmed for interpersonal exchange. I think they would hate having digital lives. I mean, purely digital lives, especially digital work lives. And especially the Dutch because they're Ugh. very social, very social. And uh, this is killing them to not be able to go out to the cafes and hang out or, or, uh, you know, collaborate. They're big collaborators and consensus builders. And, and it's hard to do that online. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm 26 and I go back and forth on it all the time. It's nice to be able to just roll out of bed in the morning and hop on, start doing work. But I, I totally get the pros and cons. <laughs> um, so going back more to more particularly to your business, why did you choose Eindhoven over other uh, tech hubs in Europe, like Copenhagen or Berlin? Um, here's the deal. Eindhoven is not a beautiful city. It's not Paris, but it has an amazing concentration of deep tech and high tech companies, just incredible. There's probably more talent here than any other place in the world. There are probably more physicists per capita here than any place in the world. We knew that this was a very talent rich tech center and bottom line, we could afford it. I mean, we looked at Berlin, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Let's see, Basel, 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 Switzerland. And this was the only place we could really afford, you know, to, to live day in and day out and not go broke. Well, and not only that, um, the Dutch are, I think it's uh, the statistic is like 95% of the Dutch speak English. So we didn't have to uh, do language immersion classes. We could, we could move here and immediately start the business, which we did. Uh, as Terry said, housing at the time in 2016 oh, was so affordable and, and plentiful. That changed a year later where, you know, all the rentals were, were snapped up by um, a lot more internationals moving into the region region. Um, but it is a lot, a lot less expensive than even Amsterdam or Rotterdam uh, within the Netherlands. Uh, the other thing is that they have a fantastic international school and our daughter, high school age daughter came with us. And so we were able to get her in uh, the international school. And luckily we did that a year ahead of time because it also has a wait list now because um, people are pouring into Eindhoven because of these job opportunities and the ability to start a company and get some funding and um, you know, tech talent, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a rich place to start. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, digging in a little bit deeper, how would you say the tech industry in Europe differs from the various tech uh, hubs in, in America, like obviously Silicon Valley or Seattle, or even uh, less of a, a hub, but a city like us in Louisville that uh, although it hasn't really found its footing is obviously trying to grow its tech talent. This is a hardware town. So everything here is focused. The Philips, the big electronics company, all the big companies here have been spun out of Philips. And so there are incredibly technical uh, precision companies. Every place else in Europe and Louisville too. I mean, you all are focused on software, med tech, and the rest of Europe, unlike the Netherlands, well, I, I can't say that the Netherlands has had huge success in fintech too, mm -hmm. and some success in success in health tech. Louisville, to me, your natural your natural space is in health tech with Humana, mm -hmm. and the aging uh, yeah, and the aging, aging healthcare companies. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. So, and, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, you know this becomes, I think part of the issue here is that Louisville might be very narrow in some of its scope with our tech talent, what we are building towards, but you all chose Eindhoven over, you know, other locations. 
how does Louisville get people to choose it over, you know, other similar situated cities, kind of like I, you all did with, with Eindhoven? I think you put Cedric Francois in front of the world. There's a guy, I think he's Belgian, right? Mm-hmm. And who's built a terrific company. I'm sure he'll build many more terrific companies. I know that he's kind of shifted a little bit toward Boston, but he started in Louisville and wow. What I see is there are some similarities between Louisville and Eindhoven. They're both um, relatively unknown. I mean, no one's ever heard of Eindhoven. A lot of people have heard of Louisville, but, but um, they're not the, they're not the stars of the Midwest. Uh, it's Nashville or it's uh, St. Louis. St. Louis or Columbus. C- Cincinnati even now in terms of startup ecosystem. But I think what has to happen is there needs to be, and we said this a long time ago when we were at Insider Louisville, there needs to be a big PR strategy uh, for mm-hmm. Louisville. Uh, and we're working on that for Eindhoven, actually, since we've been here and trying to get Eindhoven to the world, Louisville needs to, to, to make its, uh, presence on the, on the stage. And it has a lot of similar benefits in that it's inexpensive. The cost of living is low. There is a lot going on and it's poised to sort of be in breakout mode, but it's just not there yet. And so if you could get, as Terry said, some sort of you know, startup tech star, or like a Cedric Francois, who can, who can sort of be a spokesperson or an advocate, an advocate for the city to attract the talent that you need to build the startups in the ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of corporate cooperation ready there as well with Humana in, in, uh, Ford and GE and all those, uh, other big corporates in the same way that there's, uh, cooperation here with ASML and Phillips and NXP. NXP yeah. So I, I think you, you hit on a couple big points there, right? Lower cost of living, having some sort of marketing scheme to really highlight it. Uh, do you think some sort of maybe like aggressive subsidy scheme or, or are there any other ways that Louisville can try and poach talent from the Silicon Valleys or, or <laughs> Seattle's of the world? Well, you know, every day I'm reading about all of the people who are moving their companies from the Valley to Texas. It looks mm-hmm. these, these competitive advantages in that you have venture capital, you got David Jones, Jr. You got, um, who else? Weller Equity. Yeah, Weller Equity. Jonathan, Blue. Jonathan Blues in private equity. So you, you really have a big advantage over Eindhoven in that there's ready capital to deploy. You've got a great, the, the living in Louisville is tremendous. The housing's affordable. There are all these things. I, you know, I just think you have to find a Doug Cobb or uh, Steve Higdon or somebody on who thinks like they do, or aggressive former GLI person to pull all this together. And while we're on this topic, Cheryl and I were talking last night about you asked what policies we'd like to see change. We'd really like to see the economic development pulled out of the city. You don't want political people. You don't want bureaucrats doing your economic development. That's death. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I think the question that always gets asked is, and maybe we've kind of hit on this a little bit, but the question that always gets asked is, how do we attract and retain and develop tech talent? Is that the question that cities and city leaders should be asking? Or is there another way that, that cities should be going about developing their own tech talent? Well, I feel really strongly about this. And one of Eindhoven's biggest in the Netherlands as a whole, I mean, it's only 17,000 people or 17 million people in a space the size of the Valley. So what happens is kids come here from all over the world and they go to Delft. The, the, the Netherlands has a network of technical schools and they're the best in the world. There's one in Delft. There's one here in Eindhoven. There's one in Kronika. Uh, Twenta, Twenta and Groninga. And so these kids come from all over the world, including the U.S. We've met a ton of kids from the U.S. who came here for engineering school and to, you know, get these fabulous degrees and these fabulous programs. And guess what they're not doing? They're not leaving. If Louisville had a decent university, they'd be able to attract people from all over the world and they'd be able to keep them. Because once somebody's somewhere and they've established themselves, they have friends, family, whatever, they're not going to leave. 
That's what Louisville needs. But instead, Louisville's focused on sports, which is such a mistake. Well, and to add to that, uh, you have to have a place for those students or those graduates to go after they leave the university. And um, so there's a lot of um, uh, programs to um, sort of funnel those graduates from the technical university immediately to some Big sort course. of high tech job. So, yeah. so you have to have both. You have to have a stellar program. And if, if we're talking about tech talent, it needs to be some sort of tech programs, engineering or whatever. And then you have to, you know, I think those companies have to aggressively go after those graduates and keep them there and give them decent jobs that they can, you know, uh, stick around. take what they learned and put it into practice. So there's, there's a really good relationship here between the, the universities and the companies. Yeah, and it all has to be coordinated and everybody has to buy in and there has to be some funding. Yeah. And so I don't know, I'd ask you, who's going to do that, Andrew? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure there's an answer to that uh, at this moment, but you know, hitting on one, one of your points is that I know at least people that I grew up with that have graduated from UofL's, you know, speed school or, or doing uh, different tech degrees from the University of Louisville have basically been told, even for the, the higher end ones, that uh, the major companies around here that are more of the national brands, like a UPS, for example, basically say they're looking only more like the top 10, top 15% of their classes as far as who they'd hire for those jobs. So it's, it's partly training. It's partly access to more positions. You know, it, it, it almost seems like a chicken and the egg discussion on the development. Uh, but if that's the case, why do you think Louisville is losing so many tech startups now that they're getting them, you know, if you need a place for these people to go, once they graduate, why do you think these, uh, promising tech startups are moving to Boston or Austin or Silicon Valley or Denver, uh, or, or even Cincinnati, um, drive capital benchmark Kleiner Perkins. You ever heard of those guys? <laughs> It's the funding. It's always going to be the funding. I mean, uh, you know, if there could be some sort of collaboration to bring together public private funding to build a tech fund for, you know, startups or scale ups or, or uh, going back to the economic development element. You know, if there's a, a private, if you privatize that economic development, then then you might be able to attract more, um, you know, growing businesses, scale ups who bring their tech uh, company or expansion to Louisville. And then you have a place for that tech talent to go. I think that's exactly right. You know, from my perspective, I couldn't agree more. But and I kind of want to shift gears a little bit to talk more about uh, your all, you all and your all's business what actually drove your all shift from the traditional business sided news with, uh, that you were covering with insider Louisville to this new kind of tech focused uh, expat connection engine that you have with uh, dispatches? Well, you can't think of what we do in conventional terms. We're not, we purposely say we're not a media company because we're not, we're a communications company. That's different. We happen to have a website and all of the social media platforms that we can deploy for our clients. So we're not, you know, we're not a conventional news outlet. We run a lot of sponsored content. We don't have to be the New York times and call everybody for comment. It's we're, we're a different animal altogether. We couldn't make any money with advertising. We still can't make any money with advertising. No one's going to make any money as long as, as Facebook and everybody gets the majority of the revenue. So we had to think of these other ways to generate revenue and it became, everything sort of shifted from thinking we'd be a media company to now becoming a communications company with a financial company to, to, tagged on. Part of the reason we did that is because once we got here, um, our, these 
Dutch companies and venture builders were coming to us saying, can you write a press release? Can you write a blog post for you? Can you manage our social media for us in native English? Because what we discovered is the Dutch are beautiful English speakers, but you know, that's kind of sometimes where it ends. I mean, they don't, they don't write very well in English or they don't write in the correct voice like we would. And they don't English. use colloquial English. They use right. classroom English. Right. right. So, so that started this whole sort of separate entity where now we're doing marketing communications for uh, all these Dutch companies, but we're doing it in native English in sort of the American style, they say, uh, <laughs> American voice. Which makes them a little nervous. It does make them a little nervous. But, uh, but you know, so we really just uh, took a pain point and said, okay, sure, we can do that. Sure, we can, right? We can help you with your events. We can help you with the communication strategy uh, moving forward because they also want to get their story to the rest of the world and the rest of the world does speak Dutch. No, I think that you're, you're filling an absolutely essential need there. And it's great that you're using your platform to communicate, not just Europe, but with Americas and, and everywhere else. But I, I do want to go into maybe a, a rumor that I've heard that you're trying to cross pollinate, you know, Eindhoven and Louisville, the startup scenes define synergies. Is there any uh, truth to that? Is there any progress there? I think so many people would benefit from coming here. And I think so many people here would benefit from going to Louisville specifically. You know, Louisville's an amazing place with the UPS world port hub. Um, everything is on this grand scale in the U S as a whole. It's certainly true of Louisville. I really would like our kids to the, our kids we work with the Dutch kids to see how it's done. Well, and that all started with, once we got here, um, seeing very quickly that the uh, startups in the Netherlands and, and in Eindhoven in particular, there was there was a lack of early stage capital. So they they start and they they go down this we call it the subsidy route where they get you know government subsidies forty thousand here fifty thousand there, but the Dutch investors are risk averse, so they they don't want to invest especially in high tech companies or deep tech companies because you know it's a long term. Uh, it's a long-term thing. So what we saw is that the startups didn't have uh, access to early stage capital here. And in Louisville, the investors had money, but no cool. They weren't getting the deal flow. Yeah, and there's they no deal flow. The technology here, I mean, I really want to be clear on that. The technology here is nuts. People here really are focused on photonics, which is the next generation of semiconductor technology. And that's what we see every day. Again, we deal with physicists. We deal with the most advanced engineers in, on the planet. That's what Eindhoven has. So, so that's where we see pulling these two together. Yeah. There's, there's uh, investors with cash in the Midwest, not just Louisville. There are really cool tech startups and other startups here. And we want to bring them together because it's, it's the two worlds that we know. And... The U.S. Uh, with all of the fail fast and that mentality of, I mean, hell, we've been doing startups since Steve Jobs and those guys, you know, were in the garage, right? I mean, Americans know the startup game and Europeans need to see that up close and personal, which is why I would like to bring our people from Eindhoven to literally meet with and sort of learn from Cedric Francois. Mm -hmm. What the way we see doing that is uh, that's where tier one tech talent comes in is we're boots on the ground here. So we see in depth and sometimes from the inside, because we're doing communications for some of these companies, taking these most promising companies who we know need funding to the U S to Louisville, starting in Louisville, because we know that seen also and matching them up with investors so that they can get the funding that they need to catapult. The reason I keep mentioning Cedric Francois is because he did something that the Europeans can't get their head around. He built a palace, what, in maybe three or four years? That's just crazy. I mean, he, you know, he goes to an IPO. He goes to an IPO. That's oversubscribed. Yeah, oversubscribed uh, IPO. <laughs> that was When we tell them here about that, they just, they just are stunned. 
Right. Do, do you see, do you understand, you know, how impressive that is? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, the, the thing that you're hitting on, at least from my perspective is the need for, for cities to kind of lean on each other. I think that's something that Cincinnati has done a lot. They've started to have a lot more, uh, connections with Boston and helping them build their, their talent, build their capital access. Uh, and I think Louisville needs that, that same outlet. So any, especially trying to connect with a tech city like Eindhoven to me is something that could be beneficial. Like you said, uh, on both fronts. And, and look, my cousin works for Google. He used to work for Apple. He lives in Boston. He's a multimillionaire. He married a multimillionaire and they can't afford to live in Boston. So come on, Louisville looks pretty good. Well, it looks good on many fronts. There's one client uh, who's raising money next year and his company would be a perfect fit in Louisville. He's in the logistics uh, sector. So yeah. we all know that you know, Louisville's wow. a big logistics center. Um, it could also lead to a manufacturing center. I think initially it would be a distribution and sales office. And, and so we're talking to him about Louisville and all the reasons that he needs to open yeah. uh, sales distribution and eventually a manufacturing facility in Louisville, as well as get funding there. So it's not just that we want to, you know, raise money for these companies that would stay in the Netherlands. They would obviously need to expand to the U S and they all want to, they just don't know how to. Yeah. And that's where we come in. Well, I, obviously I'm a little bit biased. I live here. I love it here. I, it's hard for me to stop singing praise about Louisville. Since I've been in the city, I've done nothing but expand, uh, my connections. The network opportunities here are amazing. I, I enjoy going to school here and, and I think you're right. The ability to connect investors and money that is here kind of waiting in Louisville to the opportunity, uh, that, new talent might present. I think that that would be an amazing opportunity. If there was anything that could uh, foster that kind of connection, I, I think it's a great, a great opportunity for both cities that might be involved. But uh, unfortunately guys, we're starting to wind down. We're, we're kind of constrained by time here, but before we let you go, we've got just a couple more things. If, if there was anything that you guys are working on right now, any projects or anything you want to promote uh, any, anything like that, I'll give you all the floor. I think Cheryl just did. It's really yeah. important for us to get our client to Louisville. It's really important for him to start, a, a, I think, ultimately a manufacturing facility. This is a company where the jobs are really well paid. I mean, we can't go into a lot of detail, but we're going to make this happen. You know, we're going to make this happen. Because we want to bring together these two communities that we know and that we love and that we see can benefit from each other. And he needs what Louisville has. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, before we finally let you go, and I think you maybe hit on this earlier, but we do like to ask all our guests this final question. If you had the power to change one policy in Louisville, what would it be? I really think Louisville needs an economic development entity that's independent. That's I'm, I'm always fixated on how organizations work and who can make things happen. And I, I got to tell you, the last few years, there hadn't been a lot that's happened from our perspective. Now we're 4,000 miles away, so we may have missed a couple of things, but uh, I just think that the earlier into the, the earlier iterations of GLI were really effective. And I'd like to see that again. There's a, as a quick follow-up to that, there are a, couple of entities that have popped up in the past few years endeavor, which is a global nonprofit that has helped to basically try and guide startups into taking that next step. And you've also had leap here, which is the Louisville entrepreneurial acceleration partnership that brings together university of Louisville, the healthcare CEO council. Uh, I think they actually took over for, they actually started to work with the city directly in recent years. So there have been, two newer groups that I think are trying to address some of your concerns, but I, I do understand the point of it needs to be something separate. And I'd like to see the university of Louisville turn into an actual university until instead of a sports program. I mean, that's ridiculous. The, 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 the Valley model is Stanford, the tech scene and Sand Hill road. Think like the Valley guys think like the Valley. 
And I would just add to Terry's uh, wish of, of, of a policy change that, yes, economic development, if it's privatized or just taken out of the uh, city government hands, to open up uh, an international yeah. focus open up an international focus, open up your doors to international startups and, and market expansion from Europe. And, you know, we can funnel people in all day long. From we can help with that. We're here for you. I appreciate it. I, I think that makes, I think the international perspective makes a lot of sense, but anyways, we appreciate your time guys. And we absolutely uh, are thankful that you decided to come on our show. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This so much was really fun. fun. Thank you. We'll pick back up with our reaction segment after a word from our sponsor. Well, Luke, that was another great interview and our second in a row from from the Netherlands, this time from Eindhoven. Uh, I liked it a lot especially the fact that they are somehow a communications business, a expat and tier one tech talent job placement service, and also a tech news service. Uh, it seems to be a very broad range, but they seem to be doing some good work. Uh, I, I, and I thought they provided a lot of insight. what do you think, Luke? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely synergies between all those different competing stakeholders in the field and like a company that can, kind of work with uh, like all of the different contributors, all of the different, you know, potential expats and companies and, and everyone involved and provide news and, and kind of guidance and uh, potential job opportunities. Like the, that seems like a pretty interesting field to work in. Uh, you know, I, I could imagine needing kind of m mentorship if I was trying to make such a massive change as something like you moving to Europe mm -hmm. and being able to find, resources that are quality resources that uh you know can provide you that type of guidance i think that'd be invaluable well and i think they could also just provide so much insight into uh you know remote work and everything like that too just and that just seems to be so pertinent to you know today because of covid and everything uh, the thing that i thought was really interesting was that they really centered on this conversation around tech talent and how Eindhoven has focused on deep tech, which I have a computer science degree, and I was kind of even caught off guard by that term. Yeah, right. And, and so to me, what they've done is they found their niche, and they have just really exploited it, that city, and just gone after it and gone after it and gone after it to where they are now one of the larger tech hubs in Europe. And Europe, you know, they might be playing – second fiddle to the United States as far as tech talent right now, but they're gaining, you know, steam very, very quickly. So I'm very interested to how that kind of mindset can be applied to the United States and cities like Louisville, smaller or, or larger. Uh, I, I think there are all kinds of lessons to be learned from a city that has so effectively been able to capture uh, uh, the share that it has of its country's uh, tech talent you know and obviously eindhoven's growing the same way that louisville is growing and you know in a city that uh has so much potential like louisville does i think the most important role of our government is to try and look at uh at competitive cities uh our, our you know sister cities try and uh, glean what we can from their experience and incorporate it into our own growth as much as possible. Which is kind of the point of our podcast, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, exactly. Exactly. And I don't mean to speak so generally, but I, it's, I think it's just a massive benefit whenever you're able to talk to people that have played a role in both Louisville and now in like a new and burgeoning tech hub like mm -hmm. Eindhoven. I think it's interesting to get a perspective like that. And so what I took away from this conversation is, it's interesting. Um, maybe not what, necessarily what other people would have taken away from it, but that they stuck to, they being Eindhoven, stuck to what they do best, which is education and developing advanced mathematical engineering technology. And that helped them blossom. You know, you see something like 
Vanderbilt just generally having a great academic ins- being a great academic institution really helps Nashville thrive. And now in this era where you're seeing major corporations leave mid-sized cities like Louisville, like Indianapolis, like Cincinnati, you know, they are moving to those larger world-class cities, Atlanta, New York, Boston, West coast cities. But now you're starting to see the inverse a little bit from the companies that were already established in those large cities. Like you're seeing businesses from Silicon Valley, like Terry and Cheryl mentioned, move to Austin. Austin is becoming a tech hub. Well, that's in part because they have a fabric, they're organic, you know, they have character to their city in that they're not just a bunch of chains and, and any town USA, but that they are cool places to live, right? And I think Louisville and, and maybe some of the regional cities have some of those concepts as well. But you're seeing major corporations in the world-class cities move to towns that they think they can attract people to. And so to me, one thing that I think is a great idea, a great concept, and it's the reason I always ask the question of, are we asking the right question to when we say, can we bring, what do, what do we need to attract and retain tech talent? Mm-hmm. I don't know that that's necessarily the answer. To me, the game plan should be, look at all these companies, regardless of industry, tech included, that are now starting and adding satellite cities or satellite offices in these mid-sized cities because it's so much cost saving. They can pay people less and charge the same rates that they can out of New York or DC or Chicago or, or LA. So why doesn't a place like Louisville come together and ask all of those companies that have satellite offices in Louisville, put together a pitch book and say, Hey, Silicon Valley, you tech startups, here's exactly the blueprint. It's worked for all these other industries. Why wouldn't it work for you? Is that, is that too hyperbolic and too rose colored? Uh, no, no, not at all. I think it, we're also looking at it from the way to sell your employees. But once you do sell your employees, like if you're the company and you, you finally have like a, a large enough share of your workforce working from home, you can think about making moves that actually help you like uh, on this, you know, on the spreadsheet, on the financial end of things. So you can downsize maybe your headquarters, you know, you've seen companies like Twitter paying to break its lease, you know, because they realize like in this new post COVID world, like they just probably won't need uh, the, the size of office buildings that they, they previously mm-hmm. anticipated. And so I, I think the more that companies can do to incentivize that kind of work, you know, if, if they're not noticing any major drawbacks, which I think a lot of the research says there are very little negative, you know, drawbacks from uh, increased work at home policies, then, I, I mean, I think that will probably yield them benefits in the long run. Well, I think those are two different things that can go hand in hand, which is the remote work, yeah, but also the mid-sized city. So what you could do is you could just say, I don't care where you work, your boss could be in Chicago and all of the worker, the five workers under this boss could be in, you know, Indianapolis, Salt Lake City, St. Louis, and Athens, Georgia. Yeah. And it doesn't absolutely. matter. Or if you people still want the office experience, I think you're going to start seeing these mid-sized cities starting to be targeted more. Now, the question is going to be, is there enough talent in those cities? And I... I I feel like we use the chicken or egg argument all the time, but it's just like Louisville and other, you know, similar sized cities may not have the tech talent now, but people are willing to move for jobs. You're seeing that you, the fact that, that there's literally an industry for dispatches Europe to have people become expatriated and go over and live in Europe to take tech jobs. That's an yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's its own cottage industry. It's, it, it is kind of crazy. And I think, uh, that that kind of leads into some things that uh, the paper this week was uh, mentioned, at least in passing. The, the paper was titled uh, "The Future of Remote Work," and it was um, it was drawn up by the chief economist for Upwork. They're uh, a freelancing app service that you know allows uh, people to kind of 
advertise their skills and experience and, tr- and try and find work. So they conducted uh, some market research. One uh, portion, which was a a uh, survey of 1,500 hiring managers, including executives, VPs, managers that kind of were meant to reflect like the current sentiments in the job market for for uh, what companies are looking for in their current hires and things like that. And one stat that stood out to me is more than half of the current American workforce is working from home which is just a massive increase from pre-COVID levels, obviously. And you'd anticipate that. Yeah. And this is, this labels it as post COVID, but it's actually during COVID. We're we're in the middle of it, obviously. (laughs) obviously. Yeah. I I think that's a huge factor and we'll see what happens when they go back. I, I don't know that a large portion of those will ever go back. I think, or it's going to become something where people have an office, half the time, you know, like I would, if I had the option, I would go in the office once or twice a week, maybe, and work from home the rest of the week. Yeah. And and so we we don't know where that's going to go, but with that said, you still have the traditional companies like law firms, for example, still love to have people in person. I think that's just a mentality of certain industries. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that 50% is the level it's at right now. I, I understand, you know, some like, you know, if you're working for Amazon or, or some industries or Toyota or something like some industries just can't be done remotely, but yeah, for sure, any kind of piecework or, or like manufacturing type jobs, it, you, it's hard to imagine those go, uh, going remote or for the most part. But I, another thing that stood out that I thought was just unbelievably fascinating was that uh, over half of the managers that were surveyed said that the rollout of work from home policies went better than expected. So clearly, if management was skeptical prior to the pandemic, like the experience so far has been overwhelmingly positive in that, you know, people have been able to actually implement these policies without having a a major impact on their uh, company's ability to function properly. And it's even resulted in some, I I think the biggest benefit they, they mentioned was, well, the the number one was the lack of commute. Uh, Employees kept saying that they were saving Mm -hmm. money and that that was a huge benefit. They appreciate. I mean, I love, I love rolling out of bed and hopping on my computer and starting work in the morning. And that's awesome. Yeah. 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 But excuse me, the, the number two was actually the one I was thinking of the number two uh, most reported added benefit of remote work policies was that it, it reduced non-essential meetings leading to greater productivity, which yeah. I mean, I don't I know think, if that's true. That will stay true. Like yeah. that's something to where, you know, part, part of this rollout is that no one's fine tuned this. No one's figured out the algorithm to make this the most efficient, useful method yet of work. We're all just kind of working through at the same time, but all this was done while places like zoom we're having this rapid expansion that they struggled to keep up with as it went from mainly big businesses were using it to every business that could use it were trying to use it from home. The fact that it has been that successful where people think it is that positive to me is unbelievable and is probably uh, the reason why I think this is going to be here to stay at least in some part. Yeah. I- I think you're right in in some part, you know, some uh, employees, you know, I've talked to them, everybody I think has the friend that's kind of ready to get back to the normal uh, run of things, but there's just going to be a portion that I don't think will ever shift back to a full, like a traditional nine to five setting. And if their company is willing to go with it, as it seems like, you know, a lot have indicated they are, then yeah, there's always, there's going to be a new growing portion of the, of the workforce that, uh, is dependent on these work from home policy. Yeah, exactly. Now I, I'm actually looking at the stats for the parts of remote work that have worked poorly. Yeah. And to me, this is almost going to be something so similar to actually working in person, which is technological issues. 36% said those were the issues. Yeah. 32% said increased distractions at home. said reduced team cohesion. 30% said difficulties in communication. 23% said teams are less organized. 22% said 
less productivity, and 14% said nothing has worked poorly. So other than the distractions at home, which I think could be deal with, you know, having pets and kids and, and other things like that, to me, I don't see anything else on that list that couldn't also be done, be a product of working in the office. Yeah. Oh, right. Absolutely. I mean, technological issues happen in the office all the time. And whether I'm in the office or at home, my computer can still mess up in the same regard. And they're still just going to remote in and do, do the IT work, not physically at my computer 90% of the time. Yeah. Uh, the last, uh, the last office job I worked, I had kind of what was known about the office as like the bad computer, like the one that was just constantly going to have issues, you know, if there yeah. was like, so uh, like an online meeting or seminar that I needed to be there, needed to sign up for, needed to watch. Of course, that's like when it's going to malfunction. Mm -hmm. And like, that's when texting can get involved and like, I'm going to have some IT grunt, like running back and forth. And it's fun for nobody. Right. Right. And, and even something like, you know, reduced team cohesion or difficulty in communication to me, that's leadership, not necessarily being used to the remote work. Yeah. You know, previously, you know, I worked with one of my coworkers on, you know, we were right next to each other so we could just pop in, you know, talk whenever we needed to. And now it's to the point where, okay, well, we can share each other's screens using Skype. We can do other things. We just pick up the phone and call each other. You know, there are easy ways around it. It's just, do you have the management that has figured it out and, and understand how to, how to work cohesively? Through, yeah, exactly and i mean like maybe this, maybe that's the type of thing that could be fixed with like a, a, a hybrid type work policy right. where maybe you for the team oriented things maybe you do have to spend a certain number of hours together or in an office setting you know, mm -hmm. it might not have to be at like the headquarters or something but maybe this plays into the co-working spaces which we've talked about talked about before maybe this gives you an opportunity to work uh, in an office setting but outside of the office maybe uh, that opens up your uh, your capacity to see things outside the box. Yeah. And I think too, you know, if you do, if you do do that hybrid model though, it's going to require still the full capacity of remote work because you will always have people not in the office. So everyone would still be conferencing in via zoom. Everyone would still be conferencing in for, or, or shooting emails, communicate. So I, I don't know that the model would change if you're doing a hybrid but there might be more person to person interaction with the, the hybrid. So yeah, it'll, it'll certainly be something interesting to follow. My prediction is that it's certainly going to change the game. And if it reduces office space, I think downtowns, especially in mid-sized cities, those skyscrapers and everything are going to have to turn into more housing. Like yeah. you're going to have to have apartments in those or condos or lofts or something, because I just don't know what's going to happen to all that space. Yeah. It's that, or you have empty space, you know, and that's yeah. like the most costly thing you, it, you can have as a landlord. But, but those like two person or maybe like maybe two story office condos or something that aren't very tall that are, those are still fine because it's, you know, almost like a storefront, like it's easy, but the towers where you have to go up to the, 30th floor to me i just don't see how that stays filled uh no i think you're exactly right it's gonna it's going to accelerate trends that i think were maybe already taking place mm -hmm. the, this pandemic uh, that is and i think one of them certainly is you know the future of commercial real estate commercial workspaces is it's very uncertain at the moment you know and with more companies adopting these work from home policies. Like I think it's just growing more and more uncertain as the day goes by. Absolutely. So this is, this has been a very well-rounded episode. Where we're hitting tech. We're talking about how that interplays with remote work uh, and, and where we see both the potential for mid-sized cities to, to grow in that aspect and where we think the future works going. But with that said, I, I don't have anything else to add this episode, Luke. Do you have anything else? Nope. That's it for me. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, guys. Until next time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll talk to you later. As always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us on Building This Community. If you'd like any more information, you can follow us on Twitter at buildingthiscom, C-O-M, or you can follow Andrew at Andrew J. Klump. And you can also follow Luke at LMP43. Definitely subscribe and we look forward to talking to you guys next week.